I'm Bridget Husser and I presently hold a Chair in Risk Regulation in the Department of Sociology at the London School of Economics. Um, prior to, to being in the Sociology Department, I was Director of the ESRC Centre for Analysis of Risk and Regulation. It pulled together a multidisciplinary team from Sociology, Management, Economics, Law and the Government Department in particular, very much set up to see how the law uh, is, is operated in practice. Uh, as distinct from the law in books. Generally speaking, I would take risk to be um, anticipating untowards events and trying in regulatory terms to try and prevent them happening. So it's a very anticipatory, preventive concept. There are technical definitions of risk, but I as a sociologist am actually rather more interested in the ways that people work with concepts or don't work with concepts of risk out in the real world. The regulations very often are written down in books, and that's often known as the law in books. Uh, but actually, when it's operationalized, if you like, or it's implemented, it's implemented by people and by organizations. And they often don't have very strict legal criteria to work with, so they have to um, enforce the law using a, a whole range of other criteria. Uh, those criteria might include the sort of social interactions that they have with, um, with the people they're regulating, uh, they make judgments about whether or not they believe what they're being told. So the social and um, economic and political environment can come to bear on the ways in which the law in books is actually translated into action. And it's those sorts of decision making that I, I look at and so do other socio-legal scholars. So that work was deemed to be important by Professor Hugh Pennington when he undertook an inquiry in 2005 into um, an E. coli outbreak in South Wales in which uh, meat contaminated by E. coli was uh, fed to school children and one child died, a five-year-old. Uh, many were hospitalised and many more became very ill but weren't sufficiently ill to be put into hospital. It was a major case in Britain, the second worst case that Britain has seen. The case happens in a small Welsh village where there's a very uh, respectable, apparently, butchers that's been there for many, many, many decades, a family firm. And they're, they're trusted. They're trusted by the local schools who buy their meat from them. They're trusted by the local community. Quite misplaced trust, but this also starts to in affect the way in which the law's being enforced as well. Hugh Pennington asked me to put together a report based on my research, which might help him understand how enforcement worked in the area, but also how businesses coped with that enforcement and coped with managing risk. And he wanted to know how we might understand this in terms of the ways in which the laws were enforced and also in terms of the ways in which businesses might respond to those laws and also um, how they might manage their risk or approach risk management. Some of the solutions are, are quite low tech. They're not things that are burdensome. So actually there's no economic case for not doing them. Somebody mishandling the, the meat, very simple ways, uh, not washing their hands, cross-contaminating cooked and uncooked meats. So they often can happen because of production pressures, but also because of a very poor working environment and risk culture, which again comes down to the sorts of organisational and, and social environments within which people are working. So much business regulation is about protecting people who are not in a position to protect themselves. It could just be us as consumers, for example, or indeed the environment, if it's environmental regulation, from the, the harm that could be caused to it by an organisation who may not be so incentivised to actually protect the sorts of risks that, that are not affecting its own business. I think the value of academics looking at this is we take a much broader view. I think if we worked within a policy making unit we wouldn't be paid as sociologists to be looking at the social context of regulation. The bigger value also I think is that we're seen as, as we're, we're external, we're seen as independent, we work with very rigorous and eth ethical standards and methodological standards. Um, we're not coming with any particular gripe or, or interest in, in, in mind. So we're, we're simply there trying to understand how things work. Do they work? Don't they work? And actually, I suppose in a sense, that has a spin-off, which is, is to uh, inform policymakers also about what's going on. They don't always like what they hear, 
of course, and sometimes they don't want to, they don't want our advice because they, they, they don't like the outcome. That's particularly true probably of politicians. Um, but I think our, our, our independence and the, the rigorous methods we use and the broader view that we can take on these things and how they're interconnected because they are very interconnected with other aspects of social, economic and political life, that, that's the real value for them.